Let's all stand together. Heaven came down and glory filled my soul. Let's sing it out, sing it strong tonight.
Well, great to see everyone here this evening, and uh, man, what a great service with this morning, and then the uh, kids' Christmas party afterwards, and uh, man, that's just great to see you back tonight. I want to welcome those joining us via live stream as well, and uh, looking forward to a great service this evening, and uh, let's go ahead and pray and ask the Lord's blessing on our service tonight. Father, we do thank you that we can come again. Uh, Lord, we ask that you would just uh, work in our service tonight as well. Lord, we thank you that we can again sing praises to you, and uh, Lord, just thinking about what you did in coming down to this earth, uh, Lord, from heaven, leaving your throne and coming down to be born in a manger, uh, Lord, to live here on this earth, so, uh, Lord, that we could have eternal life as you died on the cross for our sins, and, uh, Lord, uh, just giving us that gift uh, that we can have through you, and, uh, God, I pray that you would just continue to bless in our service tonight, Lord, that you would just use the singing, uh, Lord, the uh, young people as they say their memory verses, and, uh, Lord, just the message tonight, just to use it to speak to hearts. Lord, bless in our service. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. God rest ye, merry gentlemen. Let nothing you dismay. God rest ye, merry gentlemen. Let nothing you dismay. Remember Christ our Savior was born on Christmas Day. announcements here. Um, again, don't forget uh, our candlelight service we have coming up this Wednesday evening. And uh, man, I'm looking forward to that. That's always a great uh, service. Uh, and we do have the invites out there. So please take those, invite someone to come to it. Um, and uh, I know a lot of times people uh, look for a special service to do before Christmas, uh, something like that. And so this is an opportunity to invite somebody that uh, may not normally come to a normal church service, but they'll come to a candlelight service um, and uh, we just have a great time reading the Christmas story and uh, singing uh, Christmas hymns and uh, just a great time that evening. And so uh, don't forget about that this Wednesday at 7 o'clock. And then, of course, we do have the uh, Bible reading schedule for the new year. Um, and th those are in the back as well, uh, a new program that we have uh, reading through the entire Bible, reading both the Old Testament and New Testament uh, each day. And so that's a great uh, tool. And, uh, you know, it's, uh, I always encourage people, uh, you know, you don't have to read through the Bible every year. Uh, I understand that. But um, every Christian ought to read through the entire Bible. Um, you know, every, every word God put there for us. And uh, there sometimes we get to passages of Scripture and we think, well, I just don't know what's here for me. But uh, every word is important and we ought to read, uh, you know, go through the entire Bible. And there's many, many Christians who've never read uh, the entire Bible. And so uh, this gives you an opportunity to say, well, I just don't know if I can do it in a year. Uh, it's a lot of reading and things. That's fine. We're not saying everybody has to do this. Uh, but it ought to be every Christian's desire to read all of God's Word. Uh, and so we just give you an opportunity to do that. And so uh, if you'd like that, that's there in the back. Um, and so you can take those, and we make it as a trifle, so you can keep it right there in your Bible, um, and you can kind of mark off which days as you're going through. 
And then when January's done, you can just flip it over, and there's February's uh, right there. Just follow along right there. Uh, keep it in your Bible, and that way it's easy to remember uh, where you're at and what day it is. And so uh, those are there in the back if you'd like to get those. And uh, then, of course, don't forget our new service times beginning in uh, just two weeks. It's hard to believe that we're almost to the beginning of the year already. Uh, but, of course, next Sunday is our last Sunday in uh, December, the last Sunday of the year, and then on January 2nd, we'll be beginning our new service times, and uh, again, uh, it's something that the Lord just kind of uh, led us to do because of, of the space situation that we're having, uh, and so praying that God would bless that, and uh, now, if you say, well, you know, I just, I, I don't like the idea of two services, um, then I'm going to be praying that God lays it on your heart to give the church about $2, two million dollars. Um, because, uh, because honestly, I don't like the idea of two services either. Um, I'm more selfish than anything else. I don't want to preach the same message twice. Um, but uh, because of just our seating and our space, that's something we're going to have to do. And so really be praying that we don't have to do this very long, right? Because we don't want to have to do this for a long period of time. And uh, so be praying that uh, the Lord just continues to bless uh, with our building efforts and things. And uh, if the Lord allows us to get this building, we can get it renovated quickly and move into it and uh, be right back all together in one service. So just be praying about that. But for the time being, uh, we'll be doing two services uh, on Sunday. And uh, so we'll have a nine o'clock service in the morning. And uh, uh, if you like to come to an early service, uh, if you're up and Adam, you're a morning person, right? You like to get up at the crack of dawn and, uh, you know, you've already had your breakfast and coffee and you're just twiddling your thumbs at eight o'clock in the morning, right? I'm bored, right? Then uh, come to the early service, all right? Nine o'clock, come to the early service uh, and uh, it'll be the exact same service. Well, I guess I shouldn't say the exact same service uh, because I cannot preach the exact same message word for word, okay? I tried that this past weekend. Uh, I tried that on uh, Saturday night and uh, preached the message, and I knew I was going to preach the same message Sunday night, and uh, I, I told folks it's going to be the exact same message, and I was getting criticism. Pastor, that wasn't the exact same message. You added some stuff in the second message that you didn't have in the first message, and so uh, sorry about that, okay? Um, but those of you that get to come to the second service, right, of course, that's when we'll have our uh, children's ministry. Super Church will be during the 1030 service. But those of you that get to come to the second service, you get the refined, tuned message that time, right? So there's going to be, well, I was going to say there's going to be no mistakes, but I can't promise that either. Um, but <laughs> we'll have a great time. And uh, then, of course, uh, because of having two services in the morning, uh, we're moving our Sunday school to Sunday evening. Uh, and uh, so our Sunday school will be Sunday evening. All the classes, uh, kindergarten and first, second, third, fourth, fifth, sixth, teenagers, young adults, the adults will be on Sunday evening. So I'm looking forward to that as well. So that, again, that will be a little bit different than normal. Normally we have everybody in here on Sunday night, but uh, again, just for what we're doing uh, for this time, we're going to be changing up the services a little bit so that we still have the Sunday school time, still have the classes meeting together and things like that on Sundays. Uh, so uh, looking forward to it. It's going to be a great, I think it's going to be exciting. It's just a little bit different than normal. And uh, so it'll be a change. And I know a lot of people don't like change. Uh, all right. I just don't like change. Uh, but, you know, change happens every day, right? Look in the mirror. <laughs> right. It happens every day, right? Every single day we experience change. And so I know we don't like it, but it's something we have to live with. And uh, so, uh, like I said, just keep praying that God would continue to bless in our building program and uh, what we need there and so that we can get uh, a, a new building so we can be kind of back to what we would normally be doing uh, as a church. But be in prayer for it. Pray that God, now that we have extra room, pray that God would bring in more people, invite more people to come, and uh, everybody won't be having to fight over seats, you know, we'll have a uh, uh, good amount of extra chairs and things. So be in prayer that God continues to bless uh, the church in that way as well. And then, of course, Master Club will be on Wednesday night starting the 12th. Uh, so Master Club and uh, the, the teens will start meeting on Wednesday nights on the 12th there in January also. So uh, several different changes, things we have coming up, but uh, exciting things, exciting times. And I, I would rather have to go through change because God's blessing than not have to change and just be stagnant, right? Um, I, I don't want to be stagnant. And so uh, as God continues to bless and we continue to grow, uh, we may have to go through some changes and things. But that's a good thing. That's a, that's a good 
uh, thing that we're able to do, and God continues to bless, so can, keep praying for us uh, and uh, for our church about that, all right? Also, if you didn't pick up your devotion, uh, the books that were ordered, I think there may still be a few in the office. If you didn't get those this morning, uh, make sure you get those tonight as well, all right? We'll have our ushers go ahead and come at this time, and we'll take up our offering. I think I hit everything there. Don't forget Vision Sunday, January the 9th. Man, I'm, I'm so pumped about Vision Sunday. I cannot wait to reveal uh, the new theme for the year and uh, some exciting things that we have planned for this coming year. Uh, you are not going to want to miss Vision, Vision Sunday, and that's, that's going to be a great... Uh, I, that's something I look forward to every year, just uh, the new theme and uh, new things that we're, we're going to be trying to do and stuff like that for the church. So don't forget about that January 9th as well. That's, that's coming up soon. So uh, praise the Lord for that. All right. Brother Greg, would you come this e- evening and bless our offering, please? Let's pray. Father in heaven, we consider it a privilege once again to be in your house as we continue uh, come to con- uh, finish up this particular Sunday and Sunday worship and sing praise and songs and Father, we just pray for the message as well as we, as we hear it. Pray that you allow the Spirit to work through pastors. He leads it. Father, I pray for each one. Pray for those that are here. Pray for those that are not here as well as we have different traveling uh, mercies here through this holiday season. Just uh, thank you for those that are coming and going. Thank you for those that are sick. Pray that your hand is upon them as well. So we take up this offering. Pray, for our Father, that you bless both the gift and the giver. In Jesus' name, amen. Good, wonderful. That was great. Very beautiful. And uh, it's great seeing these young people learning different instruments, learning the piano and stuff like that, and then using those uh, talents for the Lord. And uh, so praise the Lord for that. Uh, If you have your bulletin there, just turn to the back. We're going to look at our country of the week and our missionaries of the week. Uh, Our country of the week is the country of Argentina. Uh, I think most people would have a good idea of maybe where Argentina is. Uh, anybody want to give a shot where Argentina is located? Anybody? Levi? It is in South America. That's correct. It's in South America. Uh, it's quite a long country there. Uh, and, of course, Brother Bush and his family were missionaries there in Argentina for a number of years. Uh, but a population of 45 million people uh, in Argentina, of course, predominantly Roman Catholic, over uh, 80% Roman Catholic there. And uh, so a great need for the gospel uh, of Christ there in Argentina. So I hope you'll be praying for uh, the country of Argentina and the missionaries that are there. It is an open country, so missionaries can go in uh, and preach the gospel. Uh, But, of course, there is a a heavy heavy, uh, uh, Roman Catholicism influence, which, uh, of course, tries to keep people from really knowing the truth of the Word of God. And uh, they, they, you know, they talk about Jesus and they say that Jesus died on the cross and all of that. And they even, you know, have the crucifix and things. But there's a difference between just talking about Jesus and having those things and really knowing what the scripture says about who Jesus is. And, uh, and that's what people need to hear. And so be praying for the country of Argentina. And then we have our missionaries of the week, John and Debbie McLennan. Um, and uh, they are missionaries in Scotland. And the uh, McLennans were just with us uh, not too long ago, maybe a couple months ago. And uh, Brother John McLennan has that great uh, Scottish accent there. And uh, working in Scotland, uh, just praying for them and their ministry there. And so I uh, hope you'll be praying for the McLennans. And then we have Miss Anne Dreisbach. Ms. Ann Dreisbach is a missionary in Suriname, and she has been in Suriname for many, many years. Uh, just about a month or so ago, she came down with COVID and was there uh, in the hospital at the Capitol, but uh, got an email that says she was improving. Uh, but be in prayer for Ms. Dreisbach. Uh, obviously, health there uh, in these third world countries, the medical facilities are not the best, even though Ms. Dreisbach is a nurse. 
Uh, she can give good medical care, but uh, receiving good medical care is quite different. So uh, I hope you'll be in prayer for Miss Dreisbach. She's been uh, faithfully serving the Lord there in Suriname for many, many years. And so uh, be in prayer for her. And I encourage you, again, their email addresses are there. And uh, just shoot them an email and just let them know you're praying for her. Let Miss Dreisbach know, hey, we heard you had COVID. We're praying for you. Hope you're uh, feeling better, uh, and uh, if she if she's not, hopefully she'll respond and say, "Hey, keep praying." Right? Uh, if she's better, then uh, she'll say, "Hey, you know, uh, things are going well. Thank you for praying." But at least uh, email them, let them know that you're thinking about them, praying for them, and then continue praying for the country of Argentina this week. All right. If we have any young people that'd like to say a verse tonight, we'll let the young people go ahead and come up at this time, and they can get ready to say their verses this evening. All right, great. Miss Olivia, you're going to go first tonight. John 3, 16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever shall believe in him shall not perish but have everlasting life. Very good. Good job. All right, Miss Jenna. For when we are at without strength in due time, Christ died for the ungodly, Romans 5, 6. Very good. Good job. Miss Bella. Luke 4:14, 4, and we have seen and do testify that the Lord has sent, that the Father has sent His Son to be the Savior of the world. Amen. Great verse. Yes. John 11:35. Jesus wept. Very good. Good job. All right, Miss Addie. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, for whosoever believe in him should not perish but have everlasting life. Very good. Good job. Ms. McKenna. But without faith it is impossible to please him, for to them that come to God must believe that he is, and that he is a rewarder to them that diligently seek him. Hebrews 11, 6. Very good. Good job. Yes, one another as I have yoked you. Very good. Good job. Luke 2.11. For unto you is born this day in the city of David, a Savior, which is Christ the Lord. Very good. Good verse. The eyes of the Lord are in every place, holding the evil under God. Very good. Good job, Miss Grace. For unto you is born this day. In the city of David, a Savior, which is Christ the Lord, with two weapons. Very good. Good job, Miss Grace. Good job. Round to you is born this day, a Savior, which is Christ the Lord. Very good. Good job. All right. Really? God saw that the Lord, I gave his only begotten son. You shall have a belief in him. He shall not perish, but have a life. Very good. Good job. Mr. Eric? So God so loved the world, they gave it only son God. Who's so, and so, whosoever believes in him should not perish, but have not ever left after life. Very good. Good job, Eric. Great job. Good job. Levi? Romans 5, 8, but God commendeth his love toward us that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Very good. John 3, 16, God said of the world, he gave his only forgotten son that whosoever be for him should not perish but have every us in the life. Very good. Good job. Let's give them all a hand. Come on. All right, let's all stand once more. Silent night, holy night. Great Christmas night.
we've been looking um, on Sunday nights at our series on the fundamentals of the faith and going through different ones that we believe that are these doctrines are unchanging. They, they do not change no matter uh, what time of age we are in. These things do not change. Uh, obviously, there are many things that can change. Uh, you know, the way we meet can change, right? Uh, obviously, in the early churches, they didn't have large buildings uh, that people would be able to meet in, and so they had uh, smaller uh, groups of people that would meet in homes and uh, meet and things like that. So the way that things can be done can change over time, uh, but the truths of the Word of God do not change. And uh, these are fundamentals that we believe that the Bible teaches that, uh, look, they're just, they're non-negotiable. We, we don't negotiate on these things. We don't change. We don't try to change. And uh, the past couple weeks we've been looking, uh, well, kind of several weeks now, we, we dealt with the issue of salvation uh, and that salvation is by grace through faith. It is not by uh, any type of works or anything like that. And then we kind of went into... Uh, eternal security and that we cannot lose our salvation and uh, after the, the the message there were a couple people that came up and said pastor I've got a question about something um, and you know just kind of wanting a little bit more clarification and I thought tonight um, and and I can I can go either way I'm prepared for for either way to go with this tonight but I thought tonight we might do something a little bit different than a normal uh, Sunday night and that is because I, I really strongly believe that these, these things are so important that we have to have a good understanding. And, if, uh, and especially in dealing with salvation and eternal security, uh, if, there is, if there's somebody that you say, man, I've got a question about something, uh, kind of like what we do in our adult Sunday school hour, um, I'd like to just open it up and see if anybody has a question Say, well, what about, what about this, right? Uh, uh, yes, I know as a church, there's no doubt we believe in salvation is by grace through faith. Uh, that's, that's not questionable. And by, let me just say this, by having a question, it's not saying that we're not believing those things. It's just we want to make sure that we have the understanding down. We need to make sure that we, we know what Scripture says. Um, and so, for example, one of the questions that was, was asked to me uh, was, you know, we're talking about salvation, we're talking about eternal security, we can never lose your salvation, but one of the questions that was asked to me was, well, what about a Christian who says they have been saved, they've put their faith and trust in Christ, uh, but they're no longer living for Christ anymore? Uh, they, they've gone away from Christ. Uh, what, what about that person? Um, and, of course, there are many, many religions that would teach uh, that a person can lose their salvation if they choose to walk away from Christ or if they choose to, uh, they teach that if you sin, then you can lose your salvation. Um, and so I thought maybe tonight I'd just kind of open up. Does, if anybody has a question about any of that, um, you know, I'm going to just kind of see if you got a question about it. Uh, if not, like I said, I'm, I'm prepared to go two ways tonight. I've got a whole nother uh, topic we can get into, but I thought, you know, this is such an important issue. Uh, you know, maybe he's like, you know, I think I'm pretty sure in this, but, you know, I know some others that, that ask this question, and, and I'd like to know maybe how to answer them about this. Anybody have a question tonight about, about any of this? Anybody at all? Again, we're talking more towards the adults. I know the kids could come up with all kinds of questions, um, but let's, let's kind of deal mainly with adults tonight. Anybody have a question or something you'd like to ask about it? Anybody at all? Again, I'm, I'm giving you the opportunity because I think this is just such an important thing. Anybody? Matthew? Okay, so Matthew's talking about in John 10, um, John 10, 20, 
7 and 28 where he says, My sheep hear my voice and I know them and they follow me and I give unto them eternal life. Um, someone that he'd worked for said that that's showing that you have to, you have to work for your salvation. Is that what they were saying? Okay, all right. So kind of in that idea, it's only if we're following Christ that we have uh, eternal life, okay? Um, and again, there's, uh, there is the idea that only when we're following Christ, that's when we have eternal life. And so if we don't follow Christ, then, then we lose eternal life, right? Um, so let, again, let's, let's look at this passage of Scripture. Um, Look what, he, look what he's saying here. Again, it's always taking context is important. So Jesus is in the temple in Solomon's porch. Um, the Jews have come round about him. And, of course, you know the Jews were always trying to get Jesus to, to fall. They were always trying to trip him up with questions. And so this is what they said. They said unto him, How long dost thou make us to doubt? If thou be the Christ, tell us plainly. So think about what they're saying. They're saying, all right, and... And again, I don't know how much plainer Jesus can be for these people. I mean, over and over and over and over and over, he, he fulfills prophecy, he, uh, he forgives sin, he heals, he does all these things, um, and yet they're still saying, you know, well, tell us who you are, you know, show us a sign, right? And, and the same thing they're doing here. And so Jesus says, I told you, and you believe not. It's pretty simple. He says, I've already told you, and you have still chosen not to believe, Right? So they've seen everything he's done, they've listened to everything that he said, and they have chosen not to believe. The works that I do in my Father's name, they bear witness of me. But ye believed not, because ye are not of my sheep, as I said unto you. Right? So here you have these people that have come, they're trying to trip up Jesus, they're trying to say, okay, tell us who you really are. And he says, look, I've told you and you still don't believe. Right? Right? But then he says in verse 27, my sheep hear my voice and I know them and they follow me and I give unto them eternal life and they shall never perish. So Jesus says, look, those that do hear my voice, those that do believe, because again, he's making a distinction between those that believe what Jesus has said and those that do not believe. Those that believe, Jesus says, those are my sheep, right? He says, you, I've told you and you do not believe. And because you do not believe, you're not of my sheep. You're not of my flock, right? But those that have believed, they are of my flock. They are my sheep. And this is what he says. I give unto them eternal life, right? So those that believe that Jesus is the Christ, those that believe that Jesus is the Messiah, he says, I give to them eternal life, right? So it's not about... You know, it's not about whether a person says, because again, we, we, I made mention of this a little bit earlier when we were talking about the country of the week. So you have many countries, uh, especially Latin American countries, that are predominantly Catholic. And you have many Catholics that say they believe in Jesus. And they do. They believe in Jesus. The problem is, the Jesus that they believe in is not the Jesus that the Bible teaches. Because the, believe it, the, the Jesus that they believe in is a Jesus that the Catholic Church has invented. Now, yes, they, they, they believe that Jesus died on the cross, just like the Bible says. The problem is they don't believe that Jesus' payment on the cross is sufficient for their sins. That's why they still have to go to mass. That's why they still have to go to the priest to get their sins forgiven. Now, wait a minute. If Jesus' sacrifice on the cross is sufficient, why do I still have to go to a priest and have him forgive my sins? You see, we're not, they're, we're not talking about the same Jesus. We're using the same words, but we're not talking about the same Jesus, right? And that's what happens in, in religion, okay? They'll use the same words, but they're not talking about the same person or the same definition, so when Jesus says, look, I've told you who I am, and you have chosen to not believe. But those who have believed, he says, I give them eternal life, and they shall never perish. Now again, it's not just believing that Jesus died on the cross. There's 
millions and millions and millions of people around the world today that believe that Jesus died on the cross. But they do not believe that Jesus is the Savior of the world. They believe that he died on the cross, but the problem is his death on the cross is not enough to forgive my sins. Now, it it helps, but then I've got to go and do all of these other things to finish it, right? Again, we're using the same terms, we're using the same words, but has very different meanings. When we say, or when, when I say, I believe that Jesus died on the cross for my sins, I'm saying that's it. Nothing else. It's, it's not a church, right? It's not being part of First Baptist Church. It's not following a list of rules. It's not trying to, uh, you know, to do these other religious rituals and praying and all these things. No, that's it. Jesus' death on the cross and his blood is sufficient for my sins, period. Nothing else. Because when I start adding something else to that, I'm saying Jesus is not enough. He's not sufficient. And so that's why Jesus says, my sheep hear my voice, and I know them, they follow me, and I give unto them eternal life. Those that truly believe that Jesus is the Christ, that he is the Messiah, there is not another Messiah. There isn't, well, you have to believe in the Messiah, and you have to do all of these other things as well. No. He says, those that truly believe, I give unto them eternal life. Okay? And again, let's think about this. We're going we're gonna to walk our way through this. And they shall never perish. So he says, I give them eternal life, and they'll never perish. Again, eternal life means what? Eternal, eternal life, right? So if it's eternal life, then how can I lose it? Again, we have to, we have to look at Scripture. Eternal life means eternal life. It's not eternal life as long as you follow Jesus, right? It's not eternal life as long as you do all the right things. It's not eternal life as long as you are part of a church. It's not eternal life as long as you read your Bible and you pray and you tithe. No, no, no. He didn't say any of those things. What is he talking about? Belief. Believing that Jesus Christ is the only way to be saved. And so he says, I give unto them eternal life. And then he says, they shall never perish. Again, the word perish is talking about destruction. They'll never never be destroyed. They're never going to experience destruction. And it's not that he's saying we'll never die physically, but there's never going to be that separation from God again. Again, what what brings eternal life? What brings this never separation from God? It's our belief in him, right? So then what does he say? Neither shall any man pluck them out of my hand. So not only does he say, I give you eternal life, you'll never perish, but then he also says, you can never be plucked out of my hand. Nobody Nobody can pluck you out. Nobody can take you out of my hand. So again, think, think about this with me. If nobody is able to pluck me out of God's hand or Jesus' hand here, and then in the next verse he says, my father which gave them me is greater than all, no man is able to pluck them out of my father's hand. So he says, if no one is able to pluck them out of my hand and no one's able to pluck them out of God's hand, okay, then who's doing the holding? Who's doing the holding? God is. Jesus is, right? Because I'm in their hand. So they're the ones doing the holding, not me. That's why it's eternal life. That's why he says they'll never perish. Because God, Jesus Christ, is the one doing the holding. He is holding me. He's not holding me based upon what I do. He's not holding me and saying, well, all right, let me check on you. Did you, you, no, you didn't, you didn't keep that commandment. You better straighten up. If you don't straighten up, I'm about ready to drop you. <laughs> no, that's not what he says, right? He says, neither can any man pluck them out of my hand. So nobody's able to reach in and grab us out, right? He says, um, 
I and my father are one. No man is able to pluck them out of my father's hand. Uh, no man is able to pluck them out of my hand. So he says, there's no way for anybody to pull us out. And again, if you go back to John chapter 6, you can hold your place there in John 10. But if you go back to John chapter 6, in verse 37, again, the same thing here. In verse 37, he says, All that the Father giveth me shall come to me, and him that cometh to me I will in no wise cast out. So again, Jesus is the one doing the holding, and he says those that come to him, not only can nobody pluck us out or pull us out, but he says, I will in no wise cast you out. The word in no wise is, um, I, I don't know how, I don't know what it is in grammar. Um, um, I want to say it's a double negative. Now, those of you that are math, mathematicians, don't, don't confuse that. In math, a double negative becomes a positive, right? Uh, but that's not the way it is in, in grammar. It's, it, in other words, when he says no wise, and by the way, that's the same phrase that he uses here in, in verse 37 that he uses in chapter 10 in verse number 28, that never perish, it's the same phrase, and that means never, ever. Now, it's one thing just to say never, but it's a, it's a double negative. It's never, ever. So Jesus says here in verse number 36, him that cometh to me, I will in no wise cast out. I will never, ever cast them out. That's Jesus talking, right? And then he says the same thing in, verse, in chapter 10, in verse number 28 there. He says, I give unto them eternal life, and they shall never perish. And again, that word never is that same double negative. It's never, ever perish. So if he's holding me and he will never ever cast me out and he's holding me and I, he says you'll never ever perish and no man can pluck them out, is the stipulation, and again, this is where we have to go back to what salvation is based on, is our salvation based on what we do? Because if it is, then yeah, he can cast us out. When we don't shape up, when we are not doing what we're supposed to be doing, if we're not following Christ the way that he wants us to follow him, and let's, let's, just, be, let's just be completely honest. Is there anyone that follows Christ completely the way we're supposed to? No. Not one of us do. Why? Because we all, we all fail. We all make mistakes, right? Now, we should be growing in our relationship with Christ we should be growing and following Christ but all of us fail at some time so every one of us there's there's not one Christian that has ever followed Christ fully to the extent that God says this is how I want you to follow we've we've all failed Paul talks about it Paul says the things that I don't want to do I do the things that I do want to do I don't you know what he he didn't do everything that he was supposed to do as a Christian and again, don't, don't use that as an excuse. Well, you know, I guess I'm not going to be perfect, so, you know, I'm just going to keep doing what I'm doing. No, no, no. We ought to try to be better. We ought to try to be more like Christ, okay? But again, is our salvation dependent upon that? And the answer is no. Our salvation is not dependent on whether we keep a set of rituals or a set of rules. Our salvation is dependent upon what? Our faith in Christ. Again, that's why he says in Ephesians 2, 8, 9, For by grace are you saved through faith, not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. Okay? So again, those that would try to say, well, you know, we have to follow Christ, you know, to have eternal life. And if we stop following Christ, then we, we lose our salvation. Right? We lose salvation. Well, here's the problem. Go with me to Hebrews chapter 12. I'm going to show you two verses here in Hebrews, or two passages, not two verses, two passages. In Hebrews chapter 12, and again, we love verse 1 and 2, right? Wherefore, seeing we are compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which does so easily beset us, and let us run with patience the race that is set before us. By the way, if you just stop and think about that verse, 
he's talking to believers, and yet what does he say? There's a sin that easily besets us. All of us, right? Every one of us have a besetting sin. Every one of us have weak spots in our life that the devil is going to try to tempt us at. Every one of us do, right? Every single person, every single Christian has weak areas of their life. And that's where the devil's going to try to tempt us to sin, okay? And so he says, look, we have besetting sins. So he says, we've got to lay those aside. Now, again, did he say you have to lay those aside so that you can keep your salvation? No. He's talking to believers, right? Again, wherefore, seeing we also are compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses, let us, believers, lay aside every weight and the sin which thus so easily beset us, and let us run with patience the race that is set before us, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. Right? So he's saying we're, we're Christians, we're, we're trying to follow Christ, we're, we're, we're seeing where Christ is leading, and he's the author and finisher of our faith, we're following him, so we need to set aside these things that can hinder that, that race that we're running, and by the way, we ought to. If we know that there's an area of sin in our life, we need to get it out. And God convicts us about that, he says, hey, that's wrong, you shouldn't do that, get it out. For us to keep it in is sin. We're sinning by even keeping it in because we're being convicted that we know it's sin and we're not getting it right. So we have sin in our life and then we're sinning on top of it by not repenting of it and getting it out. Guess what that's going to hinder? That's going to hinder our race. That's going to hinder the way that Christ wants us to live. Okay? So he says, get it out because we're trying to follow Christ. Right? But notice he continues on. For consider him that endured such contradiction of sinners against himself, lest ye be wearied and faint in your minds. Ye have not yet resisted unto blood, striving against sin. And watch what he says. So he's talking about getting rid of these things. And then what does he say? And ye have forgotten the exhortation which speaketh unto you as unto children. My son, despise not thou the chastening of the Lord, nor faint when thou art rebuked of him. For whom the Lord loveth chasteneth and scourgeth every son whom he receiveth if ye endure chastening god dealeth with you as with sons for what son is he whom the father chasteneth not now think about this right he's talking about following christ he's talking about setting aside the sin setting aside these weights that are hindering us from being what christ wants us to be so people say well what if a christian right a christian they decide they don't want to follow Christ anymore? What if a Christian says, you know, hey, I, you know, I've, I want to go back to the things of the world. You know, I, I'm not going to do what God wants me to do. I'm not going to be in church, and I'm not going to read my Bible, and I'm not going to give, and I'm not going to do all the things that Christ wants me to do. I'm just going to live my life the way I want to do it. Does that person lose their salvation? Well, the answer, of course, is no. And here's a text passage to prove this, because think about what he's saying. He says, you have forgotten the exhortation which speaketh unto you as unto children. My son, despise not thou the chastening of the Lord, nor faint when thou art rebuked of him. If you jump down to verse number 9, he says, Furthermore, we have had fathers of our flesh which corrected us, and we gave them reverence. Right? So think about this. He's using an illustration that everybody understands. Everybody. Right? How many of us, when we were kids, never were corrected. How many of us when we were kids were never disciplined? Yeah, not one hand is raised. Why? Because we all needed discipline. Because when mom and dad said, do this, and we didn't do it, guess what that brought? Discipline. And he says, you know this, right? In verse number nine, we have had fathers of our flesh which corrected us and we gave them reverence. And even through that correction, we understood they're correcting us not because they hate us. They're correcting us because they're trying to get us to do what's right. And it brings reverence. It brings honor. It brings respect. Right? I have, I have the utmost respect for my dad. Uh, I love my dad. I, I try to honor my dad. Um, and, you know, if you've been any of the classes, you've heard him say, look, uh, you know, my dad and I don't necessarily agree 100% on everything. But even though I may not agree with him on everything, I still try to honor him and respect him. Okay? 
Um, but you know what? I remember when I was a, a child, whenever I was disciplined, there was a reason behind the discipline. The purpose of the discipline was to help me to realize that what I did was wrong, and when I do wrong, there are going to be consequences, so it's better just to do right. It's better just to do right. This is what he says. Look in verse number 11. Now, no chastening for the present seemeth to be joyous, but grievous. Amen to that. <laughs> you remember how grievous it was? Woo, buddy. Yeah. I remember I couldn't sit down for a while. That's how grievous it was. Nevertheless, afterward, it yieldeth the peaceable fruit of righteousness unto them which are exercised thereby. God says there's a purpose behind it, right? As you learn from what you're doing, from that correction, you learn from it. You say, this is wrong. I shouldn't do this because it's going to bring correction. It yields righteousness. It yields what is right. You're learning to do what is right. Okay? So think about this. <clears throat> if a Christian, when they sin or they say, you know, I'm not going to follow Jesus anymore. I'm not going to follow Christ. And they leave church. They get out of church or whatever it is. If they lose their salvation, then you need to take Hebrews chapter 12 and rip it out of your Bible. Now, please don't do that <laughs> because it needs to be there. God put it there. Why? Because think about what he says. Ye have forgotten the exhortation which speaketh unto you as unto children. My son, despise not now the chastening of who? The chastening of who? Of the Lord. Wait a minute, who gets chastened? Does a child that has never done anything wrong get chastened? And by the way, I believe there's only one child that has ever lived that probably never got chastened. That's Jesus Christ. Every one of us are stinking rotten sinners. And we have all been chastened. So think about this. He says, he's talking about the chastening of the Lord, right? He says, my son, despise not thou the chastening of the Lord. Now, who did he say that to? My son, my child. Don't despise the chastening of the Lord, nor faint when thou art rebuked of him. For whom the Lord loveth, he chasteneth and scourgeth every son whom he receiveth. So God says... When one of his children decide to go astray, he doesn't take away their salvation. What does he do? He chastens them. He disciplines them, right? But here is the problem. There are four nice-looking young men right here on this front row. Uh, there are some other guys over there, but these are the nice-looking ones right here. Four nice-looking young men right here. Of these four young men, I only have authority to discipline one of them. And the other three are saying, thank you, Lord. <laughs> I only have the authority to discipline one of them. You know why? Because only one of them is my son. Now, these other three men are nice-looking young men. But I do not have any authority to discipline these other three young men because they are not my children. We have lots of kids in the church, right? I mean, if you got to go over to the kids' Christmas party, oh my goodness, it was packed over there with kids, okay? But you know what? Of all the kids in the church that we have, I only have authority to discipline six of them. Yeah, you three girls, I, get to, I can still discipline, yeah. <laughs> You're like, what? what are you talking about? Are you? I'm 17, I'm 18, I'm 20, you know, yeah. Do you know why? Because they're my children. Now think with me about this. If when I sin, or I say, you know what, I'm not going to follow, I'm not going to follow Christ anymore, and I go my own way and I stop being a child of God what right does God have to discipline me he 
You see, if I'm not his child, again, what did he say? My son, despise not thou the chastening of the Lord, nor faint when thou rebuketh him. For whom the Lord loveth, he chasteneth and scourgeth every son whom he receiveth. If I stop being a child of God when I sin or when I go away from God, God has no right to discipline me because I'm not his son anymore. But when we understand eternal security that once we are a child of God, not by what we continue doing that keeps us a child of God, but it is that faith in Christ, when we put our faith and trust in Christ, that makes us a child of God, there are going to be times in our life when we fail. There are going to be times in our life when we go astray. And you know what God says he has every right to do? discipline why because you are his child if you stop becoming a child of God he has no right to discipline you and this is what he says for whom the Lord loveth he chasteneth and scourgeth every son whom he receiveth you know what God says there's not one child of God that is ever not needed discipline not one. <laughs> not one of us has ever not needed discipline. Why? Because we're hard-headed. Because we think we know more than God. And we think our way is better than God's. And so we just go out and do what we want to do. And God says, that's not right. You shouldn't do that. I'm telling you, I'm, I'm having the Holy Spirit convict you. Don't do that. It's not right. You shouldn't do that. And we just ignore God. And God says, okay. I warned you not to do that. And now, because you continue doing it, now comes discipline. Again, why, is he, why does God do this? Because he says, For whom the Lord loveth, he chasteneth and scourgeth every son whom he receiveth. If ye endure chastening, think about this, God dealeth with you as with sons. For what son is he whom the Father chasteneth not? Just as every father has disciplined their child at some point in their life, every child of God has been disciplined at some point in their Christian life. Because we all make mistakes. We all think we, our way is better than God's, and we start moving away from God. We don't follow the Lord the way we should. And so God has to do what? He has to discipline us to bring us back to where he wants us to be. And that's why he says the purpose of the discipline is to bring us back to righteousness, to bring us back to where God wants us to be. Because let's face it, we don't really know where we ought to be. We don't know what we ought to be. Only God does. And so God uses that to bring us back to where he wants us to be. But, now watch this, but if ye be without chastisement, and notice what he says here, Whereof all are partakers. Every true child of God, at some time in their life, will be disciplined. Most of the time, more than once. But he says, again, our salvation is not just, well, you know, I believe in Jesus. You know, well, yeah, I, I know Jesus died on the cross. I know the stories. That's not, our, that's not what our salvation is on. Our salvation is truly based upon our faith and trust in Jesus Christ. It's not just a story. It's not something we hear, but we truly believe that Christ is the only way of salvation. We put our faith and trust in him. We give him our life, and we're going to be following Christ. But notice what he says. But if ye be without chastisement. So here is a Christian, or quote unquote Christian, here's someone that says, oh yeah, I believe in Jesus, but yet they simply live however they want to live. And there is no chastisement in their life. There's no discipline of God in their life. There's no convicting of the Holy Spirit in their life. Watch what he says. Then are ye bastards and not sons. You know what he's saying? You're trying to claim a name that doesn't belong to you. 
You're trying to claim something that you have no right to claim. You're trying to claim to be a child of God, but God says, you know what? You're not my child. You can claim it all you want, but that doesn't make you my child. You know, hold your, hold your place here. I think there's, there's a passage I think many times we forget about. In Matthew chapter 7, in Matthew chapter 7, he says in verse number 21, Not everyone that saith unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven. Uh, oh, I believe in Jesus. I believe in Jesus. I believe in Jesus. Not everyone that saith unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven, but he that doeth the will of my Father which is in heaven. Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in thy name? And in thy name have cast out devils, and then I named them many wonderful works. Now, again, we have to stop and, and really think about what he's saying here. Because in verse number 21, he says, He that doeth the will of my Father which is in heaven is truly my child. But then in verse number 22, Don't the works that are listed there seem to be those that would be of the child of God? Isn't that interesting? The works that he lists in 22, he says, what do you have done? We have prophesied in thy name. We've cast out devils in thy name. We've done many wonderful works in thy name. That seems to be what we would say that, well, that seems to be the work of a Christian. They're doing the works. They're doing the right things. And they're claiming to be Christians. Watch verse number 23. And then will I profess unto them, I never knew you. I never knew you. In fact, notice what he says. Depart from me, ye that work iniquity. Now, when would be doing things in the name of Jesus be considered iniquity? I mean, aren't we supposed to be doing the work of Jesus? Aren't we supposed to be doing good things? Aren't we supposed to be following Jesus? Wait a minute. What did Jesus say? He says, many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, shall, and shall not enter into the kingdom of heaven, but he that doeth the will of my Father which is in heaven. You see, God says we've got to take a step back and stop thinking the way we want to think and say, okay, what does God say? What is the will of God? Because it's only the will of God, by the will of God, that we're able to know what God wants so that we can truly be saved. Nowhere in Scripture does God ever say that it is His will that people are saved by what they do. It's not there. All throughout Scripture we find it is the will of God that people are saved by their faith. By their faith. That's why you can say, Lord, Lord, you can say, I'm a Christian, you can say, I believe in Jesus, and you can do all the right things and still die and go to hell. That's what he just said. Why? Because they're exactly what we just saw in Hebrews chapter 12. They're claiming the name of God and they have no right to claim it. They're claiming Jesus' name. I'm a Christian. I'm a child of God. And God says, I don't know who you are. And that's why there's no discipline, there's no chastisement in their life. Now, let me be clear about this. You and I have to be very careful in this area. Because you and I do not necessarily know what is the chastisement of God and what is not? Only God knows that. Now, if you look in the early part of this verse, even in Matthew chapter 7, he says, Beware of false prophets which come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they are ravening wolves. Ye shall know them by their fruits. Do men gather grapes of thorns of, or figs of thistles? Even so, every good tree bringeth forth good fruit, but a corrupt tree bringeth forth evil fruit. A good tree cannot bring forth evil fruit, neither can a corrupt tree bring forth good fruit. Every tree that bringeth forth not, every tree, excuse me, 
Every tree that bringeth not forth good fruit is hewn down and cast into the fire. Wherefore, by their fruits ye shall know them. God says, and you hear people all the time, well, judge not lest ye be judged. Well, number one, that passage is totally taken out of context because Jesus said right here, by their fruits ye shall know them. Somebody says they're a Christian, I'm going to look at their fruit. They say, well, I'm, I'm a child of God. I'm going to look at their fruit. Do they have a desire for God? Do they have a desire for the things of God? If somebody says they're a Christian and they never, ever want to be in church, somebody says they're a Christian, they never want to read their Bible. Somebody says, I'm a Christian, they never want to spend time in prayer. Somebody says, I'm a Christian, they never want to be around the family of God. Whew. Let's do some fruit inspecting. You say, well, who are you to judge? God said, judge them by their fruit. By their fruit, you shall know them. Again, please understand, I do believe it is possible for a true child of God, true Christian that have put their faith and trust in Christ, to become wayward to fall away from what God wants them to do. I didn't say fall away from salvation. I didn't say they lose their salvation. I said they fall away from what God wants them to do. How God wants them to live, right? They can fall away from that plan of God for their life. They can never fall away from salvation. They can never lose their salvation. Remember, who's holding us? What does he give us? You can't lose it, right? But we can fall away from what his plan is for our life. And here's the thing. We have to be careful in judging people because there could be a true child of God, a true Christian that accepted Christ as their Savior. They started growing in their life, but then all of a sudden something happens and they get sucked back into the world. They get taken back into the world and they start living the ways of the world. And they can still be saved. They, they, again, they, they don't lose their salvation, but here's what's going to happen. There's going to be discipline. There's going to be chastisement. You say, how long does that take? I have no idea. It's not up to me. They're not my child. It's up to God. God knows when to bring the chastisement. God knows how long to bring the chastisement. You and I don't know those things. And that's why we have to be careful, right? I, when, when, someone, you know, when someone joins the church, I always meet with everybody who joins the church. And the first thing I ask them is their salvation testimony. Tell me how you got saved. Tell me how you got saved. And every person that meets with me, they'll have some type of salvation testimony. They'll tell me how they got saved. But you know what? That doesn't mean that I know 100% that that person is saved. All I can do is take their word for it because I can't see their heart. They can sit there and they can lie to me and I will never know. I'll never know whether they're really saved or not. It's just never going to happen until God begins to convict their heart and then they come back and say, you know what, Pastor, I, you know what, I'm not even saved. I got to get saved. They'll be like, wow, okay, let's, let's start from there, right? And so we have to be careful in judging people because we can't see their heart, but we can see fruit. And many times the fruit can give us a good indication, either one, they're not saved, or two, they're very wayward from God. And God is going to bring chastisement on them. Because here's the thing. I told you I'd show you two passages in Hebrews. Go quick me and quickly to Hebrews chapter 6. Hebrews chapter 6. Again, we, we could take verse after verse after verse simply. I mean, some of the young people quoted it tonight. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. That's pretty simple to understand, right? I mean, over and over, Romans 10, 13, for whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be 
saved, right? Over and over and over. But for some reason, people still try to want to say, well, if you, if you sin, then you lose your salvation, and then you got to get saved again, and then if you sin, you lose your salvation, and you got to get saved again. Let me, let, me, let me tell you tonight, Now I'm going to be very, very clear about this. Number one, I believe in eternal security. Number two, I do believe that a child of God can be wayward and that God will discipline them and that God will work to bring them back to himself. Okay, that's, that's between them and God. That's not between them and me. Okay, that's between them and God and God will work that. Okay, but I believe also that scripture is very clear if it were possible for someone to lose their salvation, the way many of these religions teach, if it were possible for someone to lose their salvation, then that person has no hope. You say, well, they should just get saved again. It's impossible. You see, if it is possible for a person to lose their salvation... It is impossible for them to ever get saved again. It's not possible. You say, you got scripture to back that up? Of course I do. Hebrews chapter 6. Watch what he says. Verse number 4. For it is impossible for those who were once enlightened... And have tasted of the heavenly gift and were made partakers of the Holy Ghost and have tasted the good word of God and the powers of the world to come. Who is that? Who did that just describe in verse 4 and 5? That's a Christian. That's a Christian right there, right? They've been enlightened. They have tasted the heavenly gift. They're made partakers of the Holy Ghost. You cannot be a partaker of the Holy Ghost and be lost. This is a Christian, right? Right? They have tasted the good word of God and the powers of the world. This is a Christian, right? So he says, if it, for it is impossible for this person, this Christian. Again, he's giving an example. It's impossible for a Christian. Look at verse number six. If they shall fall away to renew them again unto repentance. Did, did you see what he just said? It is impossible for a Christian, if they were to lose their salvation, to ever get saved again. It's impossible. Now again, don't forget, right? Don't forget this. It's not possible. We believe in eternal security. A person cannot lose their salvation, but there are many that say that you can. But here's the thing. If it were possible... For a Christian to lose their salvation, they can never be saved again. Never. Why? Watch what he says. Seeing they crucify to themselves the Son of God afresh and put him to an open shame. What's he saying? The reason why it is impossible for a person who has, who has been a Christian, has fallen away and they've lost their salvation, and now they've got to get saved again. He said it is impossible for that person to ever get saved again because in order for that person to get saved again, one event has to happen. Jesus Christ has to come and die again. And Jesus said he would never do it again. Jesus said he died once for all. You see, if there is some sin that can cause a Christian to lose their salvation, then that is a sin that was not paid for on the cross. And that means that sin that caused them to lose their salvation now can only be paid if Jesus Christ were to come back again and die on the cross again for that sin. And God said he'll never do it again. That's why he says it's impossible for a person to lose their salvation and ever get saved again. 
Because in order to lose your salvation, there has to be a sin that was not paid for. You've committed some sin that Jesus did not pay for on the cross. And this is what he says, For they, seeing they crucify to themselves the Son of God afresh, again, and put him to an open shame. Look, friend, Jesus Christ died once for all. And he's never going to come and die again. Never. Now, again, please don't don't misunderstand this. He's not saying you can lose your salvation and you can never get saved again. That's not what he's saying. He's saying it is impossible for this to even happen. Because if it could happen, there's no way for that person to be saved. That's why when Jesus saves us, he gives us eternal life. It's forever. That's why he says you will never, ever perish. Because of what he did on the cross 2,000 years ago, and it is finished. It's finished. So both in Hebrews chapter 12, he says, look, if you're a child of God and you go astray, there's going to be discipline. Now, in your heart, you know, you can know whether you're a child of God or not. But if you just with your mouth keep saying, I'm a Christian, 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 that doesn't change anything. You can come to church and say, I'm a Christian. You can read your Bible and say, I'm a Christian, but that doesn't change anything. You can say, Lord, Lord, all you want. But unless you've truly put your faith and trust in Jesus Christ for your salvation, you're not his child. You're not his child. And you'll not receive discipline from him. Because you don't belong to him. God loves us so much, not only that he would save us from our sin, but he loves us so much that when he sees us going astray as a father loves his child, he corrects them and chastens them to bring them back so that they do what is right. Because God loves us. Just as a father and a mother love their child and they discipline them to make them to do what is right, to help them realize you don't do this, this is wrong, it's bad. There are consequences to it. God does the same thing. Because he loves us and he chastens every son whom he receives. Why? Because even when we go astray and we all go astray, we cannot lose our salvation. Our salvation is not by what we do. It's not by, well, you know, if I'm following Jesus, then I'm saved. If I'm not following Jesus, then I'm not saved. Sorry, that doesn't work. It doesn't work. Because once you are saved, and it's not by following Jesus, it's by putting your faith and trust in Jesus Christ, then after we're saved, we're to be following him, and he's to be our example, and we're to be trying to follow what he wants for us. But if a Christian chooses to step aside and say, you know what, I'm, I'm not sure if I want to keep doing this. By the way, there's, there's, throughout Scripture, you find evidence, you find men uh, that God gives us examples of that chose, you know what, hey, I, I'm not going to do this anymore. And you know what, we never find, not one time does God ever say they lost their salvation. Not once. Why? Because you can never lose it. Did they endure chastening? Sure they did. No doubt about it. We can read it in Scripture. We can see the chastening that happened in their lives. But never one time does God ever say, I'm going to take it back. You're not just living up to the way I thought you ought to live up, so I'm just going to take this salvation thing back. You know, you're not doing everything that I think you ought to do, so I'm just going to take this eternal security thing back. No. God doesn't take it back. Because once it's given, it can never be returned can never be taken back because he's the one holding us we're not holding him sometimes we like to think we are we're not holding him he's holding us and we put our faith and trust in him it's forever That's why we have that hope. That's why we have that confidence. That's why now that we are his child, he says, look, there are some ways that I want you to live. And he has every right to ask us to live that way. 
That's why Peter tells us, be ye holy, for I am holy, God says. God has every right to say, I want you to live a holy life. I want you to live a separated life. I want you to live a life that's pleasing to me. Why does he have that right? Because he's our father. He's our God. He's our savior. And he has the right to ask us of those things. And when we start going astray, he has every right to discipline. It's not always comfortable. It's not supposed to be comfortable. It's supposed to be so that we realize what we're doing is wrong and it brings us back to where we need to be. Does everybody understand what I'm saying tonight? Is that clear? I hope it's clear. Again, that's why I said this is so important because just as we saw in Matthew, there are many false teachers out there. There are many people saying, you know, hey, you can lose your salvation and you're going to have to get resaved and you can lose your salvation. And if you don't do all the right things, you'll lose your salvation. And look, you and I didn't do anything to please God in the first place. Nothing. What does David say? David talks about he found me in a pit of miry clay. And he pulled me out of that pit and set me on a rock. He didn't say, get out of the, get out of the pit first and get on the rock and then I'll, then I'll help you. No, he pulled us out. We didn't do anything to please him. He loved us despite of our sinfulness. He loved us despite who we are and what the filthy rags that we have. He said, I still love you and I want you to be my child. And I'll send my son to die for you. And if you'll accept him, you can have eternal life. And I'll make you my child. Put that robe on you. And give you a home like no home you've ever known before. A family like no family you've ever known before. Made up of men and women all around the world. All different colors, all different languages, all different sizes. What a family to be part of the family of God. And to know that we can never, ever lose our salvation. Because it's not about us. It's not about what we have done or what we will do. It's about what Jesus Christ did on the cross. Amen? All right. Anybody have a really quick question about any of that? I don't want you to go away confused. You understand there in Hebrews when it talks about if it were possible for this to happen, you could never be saved again? Again, it's not possible. That's why he's saying it. But he says, if it were possible, you could never be saved again. Because the only way that could happen is for Jesus Christ to come and die again. And that's not going to happen. That's what Hebrews is all about that. He died once for all. Once for all. Never again. All right? Great. Very good. And that's so important. It's so vital. Let's pray together. Father, I thank you for your word, and Lord, that we can have the utmost confidence in your scriptures and what you've given to us. Lord, we do not know men's hearts. All we can see is their actions. Lord, you know their heart. Lord, I don't know, maybe tonight, maybe somebody watching via live stream, or maybe even somebody here tonight. Lord, maybe you've convicted them. They've just been saying, Lord, Lord. They've been claiming something that really does not belong to them because they've never put their faith and trust in Jesus Christ. Lord, I pray that you would just help them. Lord, to realize that they need to be saved. It's not just actions that we do that make us right with you. Lord, because there's nothing we can do to ever make us right. Lord, it's only by putting our faith and trust in Jesus Christ and what he did on the cross for us that we can be saved. Lord, to have that hope and confidence and assurance in knowing that we have eternal life. Lord, not based upon what we do. Not based upon how well we do religious rituals or keep the Ten Commandments or how often we go to church. No, that eternal life is based on Jesus Christ. 
Lord, if there might be someone that's unsure tonight, Lord, would you work in their heart? Lord, help them to get rid of the pride that's keeping them from surrendering to you. To realize that, that there's only one way to be saved. Lord, how sad to spend a life claiming to be a Christian, but knowing in our heart that we are not. And to spend eternity in a devil's hell because of it. Lord, help us to be confident in your word. And we hear, when we hear others that try to persuade us that salvation is by maybe something that we do, or being part of a church, or having to go to someone to get our sins forgiven, Lord, may we go back to your word and have the utmost confidence in what your word tells us. Lord, may we rest in knowing, let God be true and every man a liar. Father, would you help us with these things, these fundamentals, these foundational doctrinal truths that we must have settled in our heart and in our life. Lord, help us with these things. I wonder with our heads bowed and our eyes closed tonight, just the piano playing softly, no one looking about. Friend, I don't know your heart tonight. Only you and God do. But I would encourage you tonight, if you're just playing a game, it's not worth it. If you're just claiming to be a Christian, but you know in your heart you've never accepted Christ as your Savior, and you just want to keep living the life that you want to live, friend, it's not worth it. I know. Christian, maybe God's trying to work in your life. Maybe you know there's some discipline. Maybe you know there's some chastisement. Maybe you've lost your desire for the things of God. You don't want to be in church anymore. You don't want to be around Christian friends. You don't want to read your Bible. You don't want to spend time in prayer. And you know God's convicting your heart. Maybe it's time to get it right. Because if we don't, then God says, if you're his child, there will be discipline. And that's grievous. It's not something we'll endure. But because of God's love for you, it's something he'll allow you to go through to help you to come back to do what is right. lost that love God bless you for being here this evening. Again, don't forget, Wednesday night is our candlelight service, and really want to encourage you to be back for that. And invite someone to come. Uh, maybe if they even have kids, say, hey, well, there's a special time that they'll have all the kids come up and uh, read the Christmas story to them and things. And so uh, I hope you'll use that. Take those invites back there. Invite them to come to the candlelight service. And uh, it's hard to believe, man, we're coming down to the end of the year. And it's been a great year. The Lord's been so good. Amen. Let's stand together. We'll go ahead and be dismissed in a word of prayer and just thank God for what he's done in the services today. Brother Greg, would you mind dismissing us in prayer today, please?